Welcome again to the ENM 2020, the online course in ecological niche modeling. In this presentation, we'll talk about sources of primary biodiversity occurrence data. I'm John Vachorek from VertNet, and anything that makes sense or looks nice in this presentation is thanks to Paula Sornoglio, also of VertNet. So, we're supposed to cover primary biodiversity occurrence data in this talk, and we should probably be sure that we're talking about the same things. So a good way to do that is to use the definitions that are standard in the community for sharing data, and those are the ones that are given in the Darwin Core Standard, which is managed by Biodiversity Information Standards, TADWIG. Um, Darwin Core is more or less a glossary of terms and their definitions that facilitate the sharing of information about biological diversity. And what's important to us today is that those definitions are well known and it's something that we can point to and should be understood across the community. So taking advantage then of Darwin Core and their definition of occurrence, an occurrence is an existence of an organism where the organism is capitalized on purpose because it's a Darwin core organism. The existence of an organism at a particular place at a particular time. So what does it mean to be an organism in Darwin core? Well, it's a particular organism that's not capitalized. It's the word we use in normal parlance or a defined group of them that is considered to be taxonomically homogeneous. It's a bit vague, but hopefully it lets us understand that we're talking about things like uh, individuals of a species. So to continue then with our definitions, um, we need to understand what we mean by primary, or primary occurrence data. Here we mean that it hasn't gone through some kind of a summarization process. In other words, we're not looking at a checklist of species in a national park or anything like that. The, another characteristic is that they tend to be close to the source that generated them. And that doesn't mean that they're completely raw or handwritten in field notebooks or anything like that necessarily because they're often curated in museums or in large data sets and whatnot. And as such, having been digitized, they might not be the verbatim original either. So what are we interested in among all these primary biodiversity occurrence data? We can carry it down to three categories, what, where, and when categories, where the what is the taxon species, or subsets of species, if that's your interest, where they occur, location, and when, event. These three terms, taxon, location, and event, they're capitalized on purpose because they are what are called classes in Darwin Core. And that means they are a concept to which a set of fields might be attributed. So a taxon field or a taxon concept has things like scientific names and who, uh, who those names are according to, where they're published, things like that. The location class contains things like the descriptive locality and decimal latitude and longitude and other such things. And the event is occupied mostly with the date and time and under what protocols the information was gathered. So those are Darwin core classes, taxon, location, and event. We also have uh, Darwin core fields or terms, properties, whatever you like to call them, uh, that are going to be of interest to us one way or another in our search for um, data that we can use. These are the basis of record. The basis of record is going to tell us whether it's an observation or a museum specimen, things like that. The occurrence status, which is simply going to tell us whether it's a presence record or an absence record. And then a set of other 
fields that are of particular interest to tell us where to go to look for more information if it's not available to us digitally online. And these are what institution is it housed in, and in that institution what collection might it be, and if it's cataloged, what catalog number. And then recorded by and record number might be familiar to people as a collector name and a collector number uh, in case the, the things aren't cataloged in any other way. So the primary sources of data are many and these days our lives have been simplified by the existence of data aggregators and their portals and these could include very large scale observation networks. And the data aggregators are usually getting their information from museums or from citizen science initiatives uh, and so on and aggregating it all together for us and doing so by means of standards like the Darwin Core. But not every museum has yet shared its data with an aggregator. Many haven't even digitized all of their data. So they are a source of data if we can't get it in any other way, or maybe they have the data that we need, um, and they're the only ones that have what we need. And then finally, there's the set of non-institutional data that might come from individual researchers or from monitoring data sets, and those might be peer-reviewed, or they might be in the gray literature, like student theses, or uh, records from uh, from an, organ an NGO or anything like that. Among the data aggregators, there are many. I'm showing some of them here. The ones I'm showing ones that will demonstrate various characteristics that are of interest. The first characteristic of interest are those that I have a DQ flagged by in this slide. DQ referring to data quality and specifically to data quality flags. These aggregators um, will, once they have gathered up all the information from the various sources, place flags on them for information that they can detect that might be suspicious, might be blatantly wrong, might not be following standards in some way. In one way or another, it's of interest to us in terms of data quality. And uh, among these are the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, the Atlas of Living Australia, including any of its many incarnations that aren't living Australia, but rather living some other country, other atlases, but based on the same software. And then there's iDigBio in the United States, and Species Link in Brazil. Another set of those that I've chosen to put on the screen here, I remind you that there are many, many more than this, um, are those that do some kind of review of the data that end up being published. eBird and iNaturalist, which collect human observations and put those through expert review before those data are made available for research purposes. And there are Ribioma in Madagascar and Remib from Conabio in Mexico, which are countrywide and implement a lot of data quality expert review before those data get published online as well. And then VertNet with its data quality enhancement process, which is a um, feedback loop between the aggregator VertNet and it, the data publishers who want to make their data available online. And that feedback loop involves doing data quality checks, making reports for the contributors, and having them review and make the changes themselves in their own databases before running it through the process again until everyone's satisfied that the data are what they ought to be um, in order to be published. And then once it's been published in VertNet, it's also shared via other aggregators like IDBio and GBIF, but with the data quality already in place. Then there are examples of other uh, data portals like the Map of Life and the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment, 
which mostly reuse data from other sources and then add value with additional ways of looking at the data or of, of searching it or of combining it with other kinds of information. These days, most of the research-ready data from all sources ends up in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. There are exceptions to that, and I'll talk a little bit about what those are later on. But given that that is the case, I think it's worth spending the majority of the time looking at GBIF and the data mediated by GBIF um, and what consequences or what, what is of concern for the purposes of ecological niche modeling. So this is a view of the um, opening page of GBIF, allowing you to make access and searches of various aspects of underlying data. And for our purposes, we're interested in the occurrences. And as of a couple of days ago, there were nearly 1.4 billion occurrence records made available via GBIF. So once you look into the occurrences themselves, um, the, there are lots and lots of data, obviously. And GBIF provides both simple and advanced ways of getting at the subsets of those data that might be of your interest for your research. And a good thing, because 1.4 billion records is a lot to download. Among the things you can do is a free text search, which is put in anything that occurs to you and find it anywhere in any, any data record, that any occurrence data record in GBIF. But then there are also the ones that are more specific that allow you to search by particular fields. And there are both simple and advanced versions of that. Then once you have put in the uh, criteria for the data that you're looking for, there are lots of ways of actually looking at it. The one that's here by default when you look at the, the opening page is in a table form with a very few columns to give you an idea of what the scientific name is, what country, whether it has coordinates, uh, very simplified, simplified versions of those coordinates, month and year, and where did those records come from? Were they from a specimen or a human observation, and etc. There's also the gallery for those records that have accompanying media, and the media might be photos or videos or sound. There's a map of all the records that you have in the results of your search. And a nice set of ways of exploring the content taxonomically of the data that you that you searched for. And then a lot of metrics about that's the data set that you're looking at as well, such as what's the distribution of um, a months in which the records occur. And now we come to the download tab, which is all important for us because in order to do ecological niche modeling, we're going to need these data in hand. So I'll expand the matrix that shows what's available in the different kinds of download options. We're not going to be interested in species lists because uh, that isn't going to have the kind of location information that we're interested in. There are two other options then for occurrences. One is a simple download, and you can see that it does not contain the raw data as published by the data contributor, nor does it contain the links to the multimedia. Uh, so for our purposes, in order to be able to cross-check and do due diligence with the data, we probably want the Darwin Core Archive. When you download a Darwin Core archive, the content of that archive will be similar to what's shown on the screen here. There is a folder called Dataset, and in it are a bunch of files, XML files, that include the metadata for a collection that contributed data to the data set that you downloaded. So this would be information about uh, an institution's collection 
example. And those big, long identifiers are global unique identifiers to the data set that was contributing to it. So you could search on GBIF for the part that is uh, to the left of the .xml, and you could find the whole data set. Then when, we'll, when we start into the files, as opposed to the data set folder, the files that are in the Darwin Core archive include a meta.xml, which is basically a mapping telling you which fields there are in the downloaded text files, all the ones that are in the .txt, so that you can understand in terms of Darwin Core or Dublin Core or other vocabularies what those terms really mean. Then there's a metadata.xml, and that is information about the download that you made. And you can see in the little snippet on the right there that it says how many records came from which collection in your download. There's a lot of more information in this file than, than what's being shown here. Then there's the references to and links to the media associated with the same records. And then Finally, the occurrence data themselves. And in this occurrence.txt file, you'll find the data as indexed by GBIF. That means that there's, there are fields here that were not in the data publisher's original data, uh, but that were added by GBIF, including lots of interpretations and lots of flags to say what issues there might be with the data that were processed by GBIF. Next comes the rights.txt file, which tells you what the licenses are for each of the included data sets, and they may not all be the same. You can see here that there are a bunch of uh, CC0 waivers on data from different data sets, but they're not all CC0, so you have to pay attention to that because not all data can be used for all purposes. That choice is given to the original data provider. They are all CC licenses, and the most restricted of them, of them is a uh, CC DYNC, which means uh, that you have to give attribution to the data. It's a good practice to give attribution anyway. The next file on the list here is the verbatim text file and this is a, a very nice service that GBIF provides to us to give us the data as they got it so that you can see what the data publishers had to say specifically and then finally there's a file called km which simply contains a suggestion of how the data in this downloaded file ought to be cited. And that's very important. Now, what does GBIF do to interpret the data that have been published? There are three different classes of information where that are of interest to us here, and GBIF is able to do some interpretations on each of those. At the bottom of this slide, you can see a link to the uh, article that describes exactly what their data processing workflow is and what, what they do. First, among the categories of information that GBIF interprets is the taxon. In order to try to get a, um, the capacity for people to access the scientific names that they're particularly interested in, they do this by creating a taxonomic backbone what they call it, and it's based on the catalog of life. And what happens is that in the ter interpretation process of the published data, GBIF looks at the contents of the taxon fields, and there are many, including scientific name as one option, or the parsed out and separated genus specific epithet and infraspecific epithet in order to try to provide a valid or accepted name upon which to search. 
during the process of um, interpreting all of the taxon information, GBIF provides flags for the things that uh, either go wrong or that it does. So, for example, if a taxon wasn't found exactly, but something was um, found that was very close to it, there would be a flag saying the taxon match was fuzzy. Similarly, the there are flags showing whether the match had to be at a higher rank, it couldn't find the information at a lower rank, or whether it could not find a match at all. The location processing um, goes through and does quite a bit of things that would be kind of onerous and, and, and not that fun for us to do. And should be very thankful to them that they do this. One is that they look through the verbatim terms on the latitudes and longitudes, on the coordinates, and there are many of them. Uh, there's the decimal latitude and decimal longitude pair. There's also the verbatim latitude and verbatim longitude pair. And there is a, set a, a separate field called verbatim coordinates. And GBIF tries to look in all of these to try to find valid coordinates. And it's trying to determine the coordinates in the datum WGS84, if possible. And sometimes it's known what the datum is. That information is given in the geodetic datum field. And sometimes it is not. And if they're unable to interpret what the datum is, it's not provided or there's nonsense in the field, then they will um, say that it's in WGS84 and make a note to the effect that that might not be correct. After that, they other do other verifications, such as to see whether the coordinates actually fall in the country that's given. And they can do various detections of things that might go wrong, like swapping the positive and negatives on latitude and longitude. And they can derive um, country information given coordinates if the country information isn't given. So here's a, a whole set of different flags having to do with the interpretation of location that GBIF provides. I'm not going to go through these one by one, but they're of interest, and they should, you should have a look at those. And then finally, there's interpretation of the event information, specifically of the dates, because there are a lot of different fields in Darwin Core in which the date can appear. Um, and so GBIF parses the year, month, and day fields, and it also parses the event date. And it tries to compare the two of those, if, or the two sets of those, if they exist, to see if there are any mismatches and flag those. So here's a, the set of flags that have to do with event processing, whether the dates in their various forms mismatch or not, whether the date any date in there comes through as invalid, and whether or not the date is not likely. Things like something BC uh, or you know anything before Linnaeus, essentially. So we're interested in ecolo ecological niche modeling here. And it would be interesting to know, among all the data in GBIF, how many of those records have the things we need? For example, a species, a year, and coordinates. And to know what the state of affairs was before GBIF did its interpretation compared to what they did after, to know how much work they're doing on our behalf. When it comes to species, that's an extremely difficult thing to assess. Basically, we'd have to do what GBIF did to understand whether there were species in the original or not. But the nice thing is that uh, after interpretation, 98.3% of all of the occurrence records in GBIF um, come out with a species. I'm talking about uh, at least a binomial and perhaps more. When it comes to year, coming out of all of the, the date interpretation, only 71.5% of the raw data include a year in a standard form. This is based on work in a published paper uh, came out this week, in fact, uh, by Chapman et al. on data quality. 
data quality tests and assertions in general, but in it there was a test case having to do with the date information in GBIF as of the 15th of April of 2019. Uh, after interpretation, 92.4% of the records uh, can be provided with a year. So there is a significant leap in information by GBIF's data processing there. And then there's the question of coordinates. In the raw data, there are only 89.7% of the records that have coordinates. And after interpretation, GBIF is able to provide another few percentage points on that to get us up to 92.6%. So we should be excited. There's a lot of occurrence data. And we can use that in ecological niche modeling, right? Well, hold on just a second. We have to refine what our real requirements are for ecological niche modeling a little bit more than whether they have a species, a year, and coordinates. Specifically, we want to know how many have a year, how many have species, how many have a realistic full georeference using the GBIF interpreted coordinates, and how many are not absence data. Now, I'm not saying absence data can't be used, but for our purposes, we're interested in knowing what the number of presence data are. To do this, I think it's probably super important to define what I mean by a realistic full georeference. By full, I mean that it follows published standard best practice for georeferencing, and that means that it has minimally a latitude and longitude that can be interpreted as decimal latitude and longitude, that it has an uncertainty estimate, and that that can be converted into meters, and that it has a known datum. What makes it realistic? That the latitude and longitudes are within um, established limits, and that they're not both at zero because that's a suspect place, unless you're doing something marine, and even then, highly unlikely, zero, zero is probably a legacy of a database management system rather than a real coordinate. The other characteristic of being realistic is the uncertainty is greater than or equal to a meter, and it's less than the circumference of the Earth. The characteristics of the raw data in that GBIF snapshot of more than a year ago, or almost a year ago, rather, is that 47.5% um, more or less of the occurrence records have coordinates but are not georeferenced by our criteria. So they have latitude and longitude but they don't have a datum and or they don't have an uncertainty estimate. There are only 10.3% that come without coordinates and on this slide in the greenish colors are those with georeferences that are full and realistic georeferences by our definitions. And this is just to show the arrangement of those georeferences with respect to the kinds of records that they are. And the bulk of them, you'll see, come in the form of human observations. And then after that, second to that, are the preserved specimens, and after that, the machine observations, and after that, material samples, and finally, other categories, things like uh, the literature and living organisms. Interestingly, uh, the numbers of georeferenced records that come out as uh, fully georeferenced, fully and realistically georeferenced, do not include those of eBird because eBird does not include the uncertainties in the data that it shares with your GBIF. To get those data, you need to access uh, the eBird data um, that are published for scientific purposes that do include those data. And that requires requesting access and telling them how it is that you would like to use the information. So you won't get that in GBIF. And that's why our magical number of the total number of uh, occurrence records that can be used for ecological niche modeling in theory 
is 203 million, a little bit more, or only 16.8% of all of the records in GVIF. And you ask yourself, well, yeah, eBird is more than double that all on its own, right? But they're not available via GBIF in that way. So this is not including the absence data, which interestingly there are five hundred or there are five million records, or about 0.44 percent of the data that have absence as opposed to presence. Great, but we have to go further. We've been told in the question and answer session on week seven by town that uncertainties need to be comparable to environmental data resolution. And then Mona in week eight in her talk on remote sensing reiterated the fact. But to my recollection, no one in any of the foregoing talks has said what exactly that means to be comparable. So I'm going to have to make an assumption here, and I'm not an ecological niche modeler. I am a georeferencer, though. And to me, the interpretation is that the area covered by the uncertainty of the georeference should be comparable to the area covered by an environmental grid cell that you're going to use. If I'm wrong, the question and the answers period can re uh, reveal that, and we can get things straight. But I'm going to make that assumption here in order to analyze a bit further what the data in GBIF look like for our purposes. So why do we need that? I assume that the reason that the uncertainty needs to be comparable to the environmental data resolution is revealed in this paper by Miguel Fernandez and colleagues in uh, the paper entitled Locality Uncertainty and the Differential Performance of Four Common Niche-Based Modeling Techniques. In it, they show what should seem fairly obvious when you think about it is that if the occurrence data have a scale of uncertainty that covers multiple environmental conditions, and you don't know exactly where in that circle of uncertainty the actual location was, then you are bringing to bear in your models an ecological set of environmental variables that don't correspond to those of an environmental grid cell because they're covering more than one cell. And it could be the conditions of, of any of those cells. And so they show here that with the increasing buffer size or increasing uncertainty, the uh, environmental space in which that location occurs covers many, a much broader range. Here I'm trying to show that among those 203.6 million full realistic georeferences, what the distribution of the values of uncertainty are. So the y-axis is a percent percentage of these 203 million occurrence records. And on the x-axis are selected values of the uncertainty. So you can see highlighted the jumps, the jump at 10 meters, the jump at 100 meters, the jump at a kilometer, two kilometers, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, etc. This is to show that, uh, for one thing, there's an accumulation curve that there's kind of a, a large percentage of half, let's say, of the uncertainty values in these records that are two kilometers and below. And after that, they get a lot bigger. That seems to be pretty good. But it also shows that there are unrealistic jumps at values that are nice round numbers. That tells me that there are people out there doing georeferencing categorically, not by best practices. They're saying, ah, well, you know, this is in the 100 meter range, and this is in the one kilometer range, et cetera, et cetera. So beware of that. Uh, because it's not done by best practice, we're not certain if these values are realistically done or if they're done in a hurry or what.
and it should be possible to look at the locality descriptions and verify these. If you look at the 20 most common uncertainty values among those 203 million, you see the ones that had the big jumps in the previous graph, and you see some others that you wonder why are those popular numbers. Well, to me, a 14143 looks like a square root of 2 to me. So it means that it's a grid of uh, must be 100 meters by 100 meters. And that's the square root of 2, so the diagonal of it. And you see that sort of thing repeated a couple of times, multiples of that. So 1, 2, 3 kilometers are being repeated. So if we're trying to match our uncertainties, the area within a circle of uncertainty in the occurrence realm, to the resolution of an environmental grid cell, then we have a few that are kind of popular and interesting numbers. For a 30 by 30 grid cell, which would be something that you'd use for a remote sensing type of data layer, 17 meters gives you the same or similar area. 17 meters of uncertainty, the radius of a circle. And then for 90 by 90 meter environmental layers, such as that for a, a digital elevation model, uh, 51 meters is the radius. And then for a world quim, roughly one kilometer squared grid cell, 560 meters is our magical number. And so for each of these, what I've done is to plot the percentage of the georeferenced records of these 203.6 million that are of that resolution or better. So for the 17 meter radius or the 30 by 30 meter remote sensing grid cell size, 6.1% of all those 2.3 million records are viable. Similarly, for the 90 by 90, 8.7% of the 2.3 million records are viable. And even at one kilometer square grid cell, only 40% of them are viable. So we have a, in some cases, vast reduction in the number of occurrence records that are readily available to us when we try to match the scale of uncertainty to the scale of the environmental grid cell re resolution. Similarly, uh, we heard from Mona in the remote sensing talk as well that the time frame for the environmental data should be similar to the time frame for the occurrence. They should be contemporary. So I've done a bit of an analysis. The, the data that are available for um, environmental data layers from Landsat and things like that began in the year 1972. And so I, what I've done is to plot what are the number of occurrences among the uh, 203.6 million, again, that have been gathered in the period since 1973 by year. And you can see what the distribution is here. Now, if you compare and do an analysis uh, taking out the records that were before these remote sensing kinds of capabilities, then we end up with numbers that are very, very similar to those in the previous slide, the, the slide that showed uh, how many of the georeferenced records there were for each of the uh, environmental data layer resolutions of interest. And there's almost no change. In other words, all of the good quality, high resolution georeferences in this data set are recent. And most of them are usable. That's good news. Then, I know we're not allowed to ask how many occurrence records are needed for a niche model. So I'm not going to ask that. But it doesn't mean that I can't ask the question how many species have a given number of occurrences. 
so that we can look at the taxon side of things. Here I've tried to capture how many occurrences there are for how many species. So of the 203.6 million occurrences, those corresponded to more than 91,000 species. And in the pie chart, what I'm trying to show is in each section the percentage of those species that have the category of a particular number of occurrences. So, for example, for the and the species that have only one occurrence, they are the section of the pie that is 25.5% of all species in that set of fully georeferenced species. So a quarter of the species have only one occurrence. Then 13.2% have two to five occurrences and so on and so forth. So you can see that we have to reduce our expectations even further when we talk about the actual number of occurrences that are available to us to do our ecological niche modeling by species. Maybe we're lucky, maybe we have enough, but um, curb your expectations based on what you can see here. So that leads me to some conclusions. Yes, there are a lot of published sources and they're available in many different places and sometimes the same things are available, the same records are available in many different places. Uh, most of them are shared via GBIF as well, but not necessarily with the same data. I've already mentioned, for example, that eBird isn't sharing its uncertainty information via GBIF, although iNaturalist is. Uh, and OBAS, for example, has a lot of environmental measurements that it publishes in an extension to Darwin Core, and those might be available via OBIS and not at all via GBIF, certainly not queryable. Now, what this means is that there's a lot less data ready for your immediate use than you might at first think when you look at that 1.3 billion records this week in GBIF. You have to reduce that by those that are fit for your particular use, and I've tried to make an assessment of what that looks like for ecological niche modeling. Um, I think this has been brought up before, but it needs to be pounded on the head, that even if the data appear to be fit for use, it's the researcher's responsibility to be sure that they are. So check the information. We've made it easy for you to get information, and it's a lot easier to have it checked now as well. So do that. And then you may need to gather more data than are readily available, and that's going to mean work. It might mean going to museums to ask for records that you know exist but aren't digitized or aren't shared. Or it might mean taking the information that is already available uh, and taking it a step further, like georeferencing it because all that's available are locality descriptions. My advice there is to make your choices wisely in which data to spend your effort on. Um, if you have any way for example, to filter out those things that you know are not going to be of the right scale, and not high enough resolution in the occurrence location, then discard those before spending any effort on doing georeferencing, for example. Mona is going to talk a little bit later in another presentation soon about georeferencing in detail. Pay attention to that. It's very important. If you do go to the trouble and spend the effort to improve the data or verify the data, it is a very nice practice to share that information with those who published it to begin with. The world has changed in that it used to be that curators spent all their time when dealing with uh, the dispensation of information in just sending it out, finding the information for people and sending it. 
Now that's changed. The people are finding the data on their own and they're finding problems in those data and they're sending that information back to the sources. So the curators now have sort of substituted the time spent on answering emails to send data to people with time spent doing other things that are more useful, like improving the data that they have. And if you can send them georeferences that are trustworthy, that will be a godsend because it's a lot of time and effort to get that done and have it done right. Then the last one is an, uh, an observation on my part it occurred to me while doing this, and that is that as more and more data are shared, it means that it will be possible for various applications of the data, like ecological niche modeling, to get what looks like it should be enough, enough good data to do your analysis. If that's the case, it means people won't go to the effort of looking in those more difficult to find places like museums that aren't yet digitized or museums that aren't sharing their data even if they are digitized. And my observation is that the impact of those collections, those data, are going to be diminished. People basically they'll become marginalized. To me that suggests that there is something of a benefit to getting into the data sharing game and to make these data available so that they can be used for various purposes, like ecological niche modeling. I've included here references to things that were important uh, during the making of this presentation, and I think that you'll find some interesting information in all of it, and I urge you to, to pay attention to all of it. Thank you, and I hope you're all safe and well, and so are your loved ones. Take care.